Hi, everybody. Welcome to my homestead and welcome to my channel. My name is Jared. And today I'm talking again with Rabbi Gerfine. And um, Rabbi, this time, actually, there were like a bunch of questions that people had uh, that I thought I would pass on to you, um, things that they were wanting to know. So if you don't mind, I have a few questions to throw your way. Sure. Are they multiple choice? Maybe some of them. <laughs> <laughs> so the first one there now, now you and me have kind of like talked about some of these things before and um you know there's people that are really interested in these type of things so the first one is from um Miriam Contreras and she asks or she says ask him what he can tell us about the third temple and the red calf thank you and i think the reason why people are really interested in that is because i'm maybe you're following it i don't know but the temple institute you know they have some red heifers that seem like they're still on track to be uh, so that they can be used for becoming ashes. And um, so what are your thoughts on all that? Well, I just want to ask you, you know, they say if you ask a Jew a question, he answers you with a question. <laughs> so I just wanted to know if each one of your shirts going to change according to the question, because that's the perfect shirt, red dirt, for the red heifer being turned into okay. ashes. Interesting. Yeah. <laughs> I was wondering if that was intentional. <laughs> no, it, it was not. Okay. So, uh, yeah. So, first of all, the best place to, I should say, initially study about the Third Temple are the latter chapters in the book of Ezekiel, which we call Yecheskel, because that's really where it's written. Now, it's an interesting, just a side point, but it's an interesting side point. It's not really clear that it's the third temple. Why? Because even though it's generally accepted as the third temple, it was written before there was a second temple. Because e Ezekiel was passed away long before the end of the second temple. So many people thought, uh, well, why the heck should we go back from Babylon with Ezra to the land of Israel? Because now we already know that even the second temple is not going to survive because the prophet was already talking about a third temple. It's kind of an interesting question, right? I mean, you don't even have a second temple yet, and somebody's talking about a third temple. That kind of doesn't speak highly of the yet-to-arrive second temple. So one of the approaches and the answer was because, and that's why it doesn't really say the third temple, even though that's clearly what I was talking about, is because... Had they come back with Ezra and had they done things properly as they should have, the second temple would have evolved into the third temple. There would have not been a necessity for the second to go through the Roman destruction and then still waiting thousands of years later for the third to arrive. But that's that's really the best source code, um, I mean, source material on the third temple. I actually have a friend of mine who is an expert on the third temple and has produced incredible material uh, and books and so on. Uh, it was sponsored by a Christian group out of Colorado. And if you like, after our class, I'll make a note of it. I'll be happy to try to find a, a web link that you could forward to her. Maybe that would be of help as well. Yeah, I'll end up putting it, whenever I get it, um, I'll put it in the description box, you guys. Okay, now, as far as the, the red heifers, yeah, we're, everybody's watching that super closely. Because I have to just tell you a funny thing. One of the there are several ways the heifer can be disqualified, and one of them is if it produces two black hairs. Mm -hmm. uh, the reason I'm just mentioning that is because I know it's going to be hard for you to believe this, but once upon a time I was a complete total redhead. Everything red, red fire red, redhead. And then I remember, like on my hand right here, two little black hairs grew, and I'm, okay, they're not going to be taking me to to the. <laughs> <laughs> I'm off the hook. <laughs> However, the main thing, as it's written in the Bible, is because it's required as part of a process, an elaborate process for that matter, which uh, then produces, a, a let's say, a, a vial of liquid and so on. And that vial can then be utilized to purify people who are exposed to or have encounters with dead people. That could be either in a hospital where somebody died, but you were in the same building at the same time there was a dead body. It could be walking over a grave. There are many, many ways, you know, being in the army, picking up your buddy who got killed. 
But whatever it is, once a person becomes spiritually blemished by contact with the dead, which of all the levels of impurity, that is the most severe, there is no way to circumvent that without the process of the, the sprinkling produced by the red heifer. And I got these things in English, the hyssop, I think, and the cedar tree, I'm trying to scrounge out the English words here. Uh, and, and, and the other reason that that's a really big, big issue here is that there are, I would say, maybe hundreds of thousands of people who are just waiting to go up on the Temple Mount. But you cannot, from a, a law perspective, I mean, Jewish law perspective, one may not go up on the Temple Mount unless they have been purified of contact with the dead. So since that happened, hasn't happened in the last 2,000 years, if this process does go through, it will be the first time in about over 2,000 years that it will have been processed and people will actually be able to be purified from the contact with the dead and then they will be able to go up on the Temple Mount. So maybe now today you get dozens of people going up. You, you can actually have, I mean, just, you know, whatever, you can have 300,000 very Orthodox Jews all at once going up on the Temple Mount. I mean, that could rock the planet in a big way. So that's why it's a closely watched story. I have a question about the quantity because um, as I've studied it, and I think I remember this specifically from Israel 365, they were talking about how in the Talmud, um, it says that there's essentially um, before now only been nine red heifers that had been used uh, for this process. And so this one would be the 10th. And so that, that covers a really long period of time. Um, how, like, how, how long could they make those ashes last? Because if, if it say that it's just like one heifer, but you're talking about, I don't know, potentially millions of people, millions of Jews that go to the temple. Like, how do you, how does that get spread out? I don't know the exact answer, but I will tell you, just on my studies, what I think. Um, I don't think there is a problem of dilution. So it's something like a little morsel of a drop that can be placed in other things and therefore it can be parsed out in a very small way in order to be able to create huge quantities. Plus, I don't think there's even a minimal amount that requires contact. So it could maybe even be as much as an eye drop uh, eyedropper that is on a person would suffice it's not like a person it's not like a mikvah where a person bathes in it or you know something of that nature it's it's very minimal yeah it'd be interesting to see however that plays out uh now a question uh and i, I we've talked about this before a little bit you and my you and i but okay so say that this happens like they get to the the age where it's like okay it's good to go because i think isn't it two years and a day like that's when yeah. right. it can happen um what what do you think happens at that point do you think that that would really excite a lot of judaism people a lot of jews um or do you think people would just be like well that's great but we still can't build the temple or do you think people would be like okay well now that we have this maybe Messiah is almost here, or how? What? What? Just what do you think would happen? Well, I, it'll definitely excite a lot of Muslims. Yeah, I, I, I know that they've. I've seen a few articles about them talking about it. Yeah. Uh huh. Sure. That this is all part of the takeover of of the Temple Mount. I never exactly understood how you could take over something that was always yours, but that's another issue, not for politics, but uh. You know, it's very interesting now. I don't. I really don't want to get into politics, so I can edit this if you don't like what I have to say. Yeah. But it, no, no, I don't mind. But you know, now um, the Abbas is claiming that the Palestinians are actually the Canaanites, and they are doing that in order to show that they were actually here oh. before the Jews. However, not that anyone's ever really attributed too much IQ value to Abbas. Had he really thought it through, he would have realized that was about the stupidest chess move he could have ever made on the board for several reasons. First of all, by saying that he identifies as the Canaanite is an endorsement to all the literature about the Jews in the land. Because who are the Canaanites? Where are they documented, if not in the Bible? 
I mean, of course, there are relics and so on, but not enough to piece together what does it really mean to be a Canaanite. But the but the but therefore, in other words, if you believe that and you believe the source, which would be the Bible, then you also have to believe. Well, there was a Mishkan for three hundred plus years. There was a first temple for four hundred plus years. There was a second temple for four hundred plus years. There are the twelve tribes. There was a King David. There is a King. Son. I mean, it's just a shoot yourself in the foot statement. And in the real speaking of shoot yourself statement is that, well, then if they are the Canaanites, suddenly there's a biblical commandment to wipe them all out. Yeah. So that's a really bad chess move. Just kind of throwing that out. Yeah, and now in today's sure. paper, UNESCO, which, of course, is the, you know, the uh, pillar of light and wisdom and truth in the world, has now trying to declare that the city of Jericho is a historical Palestinian site. Now, the reason that's also pretty stupid is those of us that believe in the Bible will remember what Joshua did to the city of Jericho, plus the curse that he put on the city of Jericho. So to want to take over ownership of that, it's, you know, I don't know, how stupid can you get? So it's just kind of a it's I just believe it's sort of like God coming in and, and making people's tongues get twisted and saying things that they really don't think through because it's all part of something phenomenal that's coming together very quickly, which brings me back to your question about who's going to get who's going to get what. I think in Israel, you're going to have a basic three pronged response. There are going to be people who will be online to get zapped. I mean, like even, you know, we used to sleep outside the stadium for Beatles tickets in the morning. I think the lines will be a lot longer than that to be on like the red heifer sprinkling line. Yeah. So the, there'll be a huge amount of people very interested in that. Uh, and then there'll be people who will be concerned about it because people like to use this term called status quo. So the Middle East is not too famous for status quo. You know, whatever status is today, it's usually quo by tomorrow. So this idea of, well, you know, they have controlled the Temple Mount for all these years and so on. Maybe we shouldn't really go up there and, and rock the boat. So they'll see this as more of a kind of a Zionist, almost like the, the Palestinians are saying, to, to take over the Temple Mount. I don't know. It's hard to know. I mean, that's the beauty of being alive over here and even alive today in this world, even in Wichita. Just stay tuned. You know, don't yeah. touch that dial. I saw I mean, an article. I, oh, go ahead. Go ahead. No, no, please. I, I saw it. Not an article. I saw a uh, YouTube video. It was put out by my Israel channel. It's a guy that's there in Israel. And he was going around uh, kind of asking people on the street what they thought about the Third Temple. A asking Jews specifically, like, uh, for one, do they know about the, in the Temple Institute? Or how do they picture the Temple coming about? And some people said, well, you know, it's probably going to be through a peaceful process. Uh, Messiah will come and through peaceful means, you know, it'll be established. Other people think, and I think that you've said this before, um, there's the possibility that it would come out of heaven and then come down and be on the Temple Mount. So it seems like there's a variety um, of opinions as far as that goes. So um, I can't remember where I was going with that. Lost my train of thought. <laughs> Um, while you well, while you're looking for the train, I want to ask you: Did I ever share with you my story with British TV about the Temple Mount? No, I don't think so. I, I'm happy to if you'd like to me to yeah. bore you for a minute. Okay, no. so this goes. I don't remember what year it was. All I remember was the holiday, ironically, of Hanukkah. You'll see why that's important in a minute. And there was a brand new channel in England called the Fourth Channel, which is now, of course, an old established channel. And one of the shows they had, I believe, was called the way it is or the way it was, something like that. And the rule of the show was they turn on the camera and whatever they shot in those 27 or whatever minutes, they weren't allowed to turn off the camera and they weren't allowed to edit it. That was like the novelty of the show. So obviously what they did was they came up with a theme and they set all the pieces up so that it, you know, show wouldn't be boring. And somebody came up with an idea, hey, Let's go to the Middle East. Let's go to Jerusalem and let's do a program called Whose Mountain Is It? Like King of the Hill. So they they had the first person was the priest at the Church of the Holy Sepulchre, which is in the old city. 
And from there, they went up to the Temple Mount and they spoke to the Mufti. And then they came out of the Temple Mount and head down the stairs, turning around towards the Western Wall, where yours truly was to represent before 54 million Brits, that's what they claim their viewing audience was, or some crazy number, the Jews. So the, the, uh, the, the priest really didn't have much to say because there's no kind of Christian claim that's ever been announced or about that whatsoever. But the Mufti had what he had to say, and then they, they came down. Now, as they were approaching the Western Wall, there used to be a guard there. It's all changed now, the way it was then. And he saw this TV guy coming, and he immediately puts his hand, like, over the lens. I'm thinking, like, you know, 50 million Brits are now reading his palm lines and this and that, because they're not allowed to edit it out. So I run over, I pull the guy's hand off, and I sent him in Hebrew. It's okay, they're with me. And he said, okay, but just stand here. So I stood there. And immediately I understood that the guy with the microphone did not like Jews. But the guy behind the camera was fine with Jews, but hated this guy with a microphone. I, I picked this all up within a blink of an eye. How? Yeah. Because the guy says, okay, well, let's get started now that that man's out of the way. He says, by the way, um, I thought that Jews are not allowed to be associated with pigs. This is the opening question. I said, well, possibly. And I mean, what are you talking about? Footballs? So he said, no, look. And he points to a religious Jew who has what we call peyote or side curls. He mm -hmm. says, look, why are these Jews wearing pig curls? So I used to, my hair was longer. I used to have them. I wore them also, but I wore them tied up under my kippah. So I blew his mind. He didn't know I had them. I reached up and I pulled one out. I said, oh, you mean this? I saw the cameraman smile from ear to ear. This guy jumped back like I was a leper. I said, no, no, it, what, what do you think? It's a horn? You think Jews have horns? Try it. It's only hair. You might be surprised. So that's how we started off this battle. He so immediately goes, okay, well, I understand something. Why are all the Jews wailing at the wailing wall? I said, first of all, we don't call it the wailing wall. That's maybe what you call it, because maybe you don't like seeing Jews over there, so you wail. But for us, it's the happy wall. In fact, I don't hear anybody wailing. I just hear people talking to God. Nobody's punching anybody. Nobody's calling anybody a bad name. They're just happy people praying to God. What, like, where's your problem? Ignores the answer. And then here comes the big one. He says, okay, well, now down to our real question. And what is your claim to the temple, mount? Uh, sorry, to the mountain? I said, well, I don't know. I said, well, let me ask you a question. Are you a Christian? So he reaches in, boom, out comes this little cross. I said, great. So you're familiar with the Bible, correct? Yeah. So you ever hear of King Solomon? Oh, for sure. I said, well, wise King Solomon was a great judge. Now, what do judges do on real estate disputes, even today in the United Kingdom and the United States? They do a location visit. They come down and they physically look at the disputed land. So now let's imagine that you are the bright, intelligent King Solomon. And you're asking me this question. Let's take a look. Let's look, what do we see here? Well, we see the Western Wall, and above it, we see the Alaska Mosque and the Dome of the Rock. Hmm, one on top of the other. Hmm, can we solve this puzzle? Can we figure out which one of them must have been here first? Let me take a shot at it. I think that the mosques were here first, and those Jews, they came in the middle of the night they dug a huge hole and they shoved their temple underneath those mosques just so they could claim it was there. Isn't that what happened? <laughs> Anyhow, <laughs> so at this point, <laughs> the guy says, that's it. Okay, I think we're done. And the camera says, no, no, you still have five minutes. But he just literally turned around and ching, ran, ran away. Wow. And, the, and the cameraman looks at me and he puts his hand over the, like, the remote mic. He says, I'm also a Christian. That was really good. That was the end. <laughs> <laughs> anyhow, true story. Oh, of course, I've got the and it was Hanukkah. And I thought of us, oh, here I am. Here come the Romans. And I'm like the little Maccabean with my back to the Western Wall. That was the whole tie-in there, which was so <laughs> interesting the day it turned out. Anyhow, I'm sorry. No, that's okay. So yeah, uh, going back, I guess we'll just have to wait and see what happens but certainly I, well I, I wonder if like this would happen let me let me ask you if you think this would happen 
when Israel became a country, I'm sure that there were a lot of Jews that maybe weren't so religious before that maybe suddenly that kind of like increased their, um, I don't know, like it, it made them come back to their beliefs or help them become more religious. Do you think that that would happen whenever the red heifer is prepared and, and we have the ashes? Well, actually, what you said is very interesting. The, the founders of, of Israel were very secular. They didn't even want to reference God, even yeah. in a grammatical hint to God in any of the texts whatsoever. Uh, unlike Herzl, who wasn't like that in the least. But that that was sort of the situation. You know, and look, you know, we always say there's only one judge and it's not us. So we should never judge other people. And we don't know what they were going through or whatever. But clearly, I've been here 50 years. And I can I marvel how the most non-religious, seemingly Jew I see today will say all the time now, thank God, thank God, and 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 people are like re referencing Bible quotes. It's I mean that the the growth, which of course will never be seen on CNN, but it will be seen on your YouTube channel. Uh, the growth of people coming back to Torah and their awareness of what the land is and so on is extraordinary and it's rapid. There was actually a sort of a, not really a prophet, but it could have been a prophet, Rabbi Cook, who in the 1930s already said that what will happen in Israel is that many of the secular Jews will leave the country, which we've seen in droves. That's why you have huge Israeli communities in various parts of the United States and other parts of the world. Then eventually the secular families will come down to uh, one baby and a dog, which we see a lot of now. And at the same time, the religious families are going to be having anywhere between 10 to 15 children, uh, which has already been happening now for 50, 60 years. So the, the numbers of the Orthodox are just expounding, expounding quickly. And at the same time, there'll be many Jews, such as myself and others, who had no Jewish background whatsoever, who have made a, a turnaround and become very involved in the religion and, and the awareness of where we are and what's happening. So that's, and the way he described it was very beautiful. He said, when the temple was built, who built it? Workmen, craftsmen, you know, they built it. But the minute it was finished, those people were no longer allowed to come into the temple. Only the priests and the Levites could come in and work there. So he said that there was a period of time when the body, the physical body of Israel was being built or is being built. But then there's going to change and they'll start to be the building of the soul of the people in the land. And, and that's what's been happening clearly over the last 30 years. And, and it's it's not algebraic, it's geometric, the, the Nike curve in the way that that's happening. Yeah, I, I read something along those same lines recently where I can't remember who, who said it, but they were saying that essentially like this first half of the state of Israel's history could be likened to King Saul where, you know, th there were some issues there, but, you know, so mostly like you were talking about how in the very beginning it was mostly secular people and, and things are getting worked out and the States being set up and stuff like that. But then there's a transition from that to like a David area, according to what I was reading, where now the spiritual things will come in. And, and so I can't, I can't help but to think that if, um, if they do successfully produce uh, ashes from the red heifer and then at least the religious community gets really excited about it, maybe that would rub off or help help others remember who they are and, you know, bring them, them, bring them in closer. And yeah, and I've actually talked about that before as far as like <clears throat> the growing number of religious people in, um, in Israel. There, there's been a couple articles put out talking about how the youth are becoming more religious and and stuff like that. In fact, that's kind of like a good segue into um, this other question here. Uh, this is from Dawn Ireland, and she asks, uh, she says, ask what he thinks of the civil unrest there. How does it fit within his religion? Is it safe for tourists to visit? And I, I thought that that was a good segue because from what I understand, or from, from what I can tell, my opinion is it seems like those that are secular in the country are probably losing power. You know, they, they kind of only like their big card is probably the the Supreme or the I don't know what it's called, the Supreme Court or the High Court. And so 
like to keep Israel as secular as possible or to accommodate them, you know, they, they, that's what's like causing a lot of the unrest. Whereas the majority of the country through elected leaders, they, they've decided what they want to do, you know, cause that's democracy they elected and, and that's what they're wanting to do is become more religious. So anyway, so what are your thoughts on all that? Well, that's a very good question. Uh, I, I would just say a couple of things to keep in mind. First of all, unfortunately, there is history, precedent of Jewish civil war. When is the first civil war written in the Bible? I don't know, but I immediately think about the time of the Greeks. I don't know if like... Greeks? Before Way the... before that. Um, After Solomon? Like no, fighting... way before that. Um, Not to put you on the spot or anything. I feel like I should probably know this, but... No, for 25 points. I give it up. I don't know. Uh, I can't, I can't okay, think. I'm sorry. Oh, my... I, I don't know. Like... Uh, the the 12 sons of israel and joseph like sending i don't well, know that wasn't a civil war or the real civil war with like people getting killed actual civil war i don't know then yeah so it was at the golden calf okay moses okay. comes down and he says who's with god <clears throat> and all the levites came and there was a civil war between jews against jews actually there were a lot of non-jews there as well who got killed but it it was a civil war the next civil war <clears throat> was in the book of Judges, which was during the time of uh, the infamous story of the um, concubine who was gang raped in a, a city or village in the tribe of Benjamin. Right. And she died and her master cut her into 12 pieces and sent a part of her body to each one of the tribe leaders and said, do you tolerate this? And the whole nation rose up and there was a huge civil war where they almost decimated all of Benjamin. I hope your kid's not running around hearing this. But they almost decimated the entire tribe. In fact, only 600 men survived by running up into the mountains. And one of those 600 men was King Saul. He was one of them? I That's know. right. I can't, I in fact, that. I got to tell you something. This is really weird. That we're talking about this. I just really, I, this might not mean anything to you, but to me, I might just blew my mind tonight because over here in Israel, it's already night. I know by you, it's not. Yeah. So, and you know, in the Jewish calendar, the day begins at nightfall, not at midnight or right. So, we're, we are already in your tomorrow on a Hebrew calendar. Yeah. So, the, the tomorrow that I'm in now, your tomorrow is a day called the 15th of the month of Av. Okay. which is considered the Jewish Valentine's Day. And it was the day when the tribes removed the ban of marrying people, the survivors of the tribe of Benjamin, so that they could repopulate and come back into the nation. And so it was on this day that the tribe of Benjamin was forgiven and allowed to re-enter through marriages uh, into the nation. So it's kind of funny that we would be discussing that event on the very day that it finally, you know, healed its wounds. Yeah. Sorry, yeah. not to go off on too much of a tangent, but, um, you know, we've talked about before how in Judaism, uh, tribal lineage is determined by the father, whereas Jewish lineage is determined by the mother. So when they repopulated Benjamin, um, would it have only been through I mean, was there like an exception there where uh because like you had like the 600 remaining that were males of benjamin but those that married in like did they did they was that considered repopulating benjamin no, I, I think it was i just think that the 600 were allowed to marry oh it, okay that they could marry okay right right okay all right so anyway so about the yeah so the current the situation civil unrest. Is, right there are you know, I want to tell you, in the Bible, it's very interesting. I, it sounds like I'm digressing. I'm not, I promise you. Okay. In the Bible, where it discusses the idea of kosher animals that may be eaten, there are three types that are discussed. There are animals, birds, and fish. You can look it up, black and white in the Bible. When it discusses the animals, it gives you the signs, chewing cud, split hoof. And then, interestingly enough, it actually gives you four examples 
like the camel and so on. Then, uh, uh, sorry, four examples of animals which only have one of the two and is therefore not kosher. Then when it comes to the birds, it doesn't give you any signs to look for, but it gives you a really long list of bird names, which is incredible because how out in the desert would they possibly know names of birds that have only been hundreds of years later became known from different parts of the world. But if you're God, you know all that. And then the fish, it doesn't mention any names of fish. It just gives you the signs of scales and fins and a few others. So in the list of the birds, there's one bird which is called the re'e. The, re the word re'e means to see. And our sages teach us, what is this bird and why is it called the seer? And it says that these are people, and I'm not at all suggesting this about the person who asked you this question, so I just to make sure that's clear. But forgiving that person, there are many people who love to sit outside of Israel and look inside to find things to point fingers at and talk about how horrible and look at how bad, and those kind of things. That's called the non-kosher bird as the re'e. So there are a lot of people who, in today's media world and other things, they drool, over, especially in Iran, over the hope that this is Israel imploding and there are people here who are even, even saying, yes, it's going to be a civil war. Guess what? The election's finished. The protests have basically petered out. I walk around the streets. Nobody's yelling at anybody. And even during the demonstrations, although the press had a really hunt for something that potentially could have been explosive because if they only had good news, no one would watch CNN, which we say over here stands for certainly not news. And, and as a result of that, they couldn't find it. There were no Jews punching Jews. Yeah, there were some skirmishes with the police, but that's always what police are about, especially when they're on horses and horses get scared. But, but there was nothing. Nothing happened like that. And meanwhile, of course, that's the kind of dark cloud that people try to surround around the country. Just like there was a dark cloud around Mount Sinai when God appeared. So there'll be a dark cloud that will alienate people from the land of Israel before God really appears in the, as Messiah and so on. Because that'll be the acid test, who's really with God. If it's all open and obvious, no challenge there, no reward there. But if it's dark, but you, meaning we, have the spiritual vision to see through the darkness to the light on the other side. There's great reward and great uh, success in that. So I, I think that, it, you know, that, that's just one thing. In terms of the question about uh, are tourists welcome, you know, I, 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 well, right now we're on vacation, but I was teaching in the old city every day. I would say I lost 15 to 20 minutes each day because I couldn't get through the streets because of all the tourists. Yeah. I mean, it's so it's safe. Because <clears throat> that's what she was, it's safe though. Like it's like, it's safe to be there. I mean, it's safe, but you know what? I mean, that, I mean, anywhere in the world, who knows what could happen when they get bopped in the head by the meteorite, right? So mm -hmm. I'm just saying, you know, <laughs> by the way, I have to tell you this, you might enjoy this. Do you ever see, do you know Gary Larson, the far side, the cartoonist? Yeah. Oh, I, one of my I miss those. Those were the best. He was the best. Do you remember his one God at the computer? That sounds familiar. I know that he's done a few with God, but yeah. So it's the guy with the you know the classic long white beard, the white robe, and he's got a screen there. And on the screen is a really dorky looking guy, just whistling, minding his own business, walking down the street, unknown to him, that a piano which was oh, being yeah. remember that? Yeah, I do remember right. that one. It snapped. It was coming down a hundred million miles in his head. And on the keyboard, God's hitting a button called Smite. So, you know, what's safe? Safe is just to believe in God. That's safe. That's the only safe. But on a practical level, yes, Israel is packed with tourists, more, much more so since some Corona days. Yeah. I mean, I can't get there yet. Hopefully someday I'll be able to go visit. But I, for the meantime, I watch uh, several YouTube channels where they do like it's like these th maybe three or four different channels where they just like walk through the streets, mostly of Jerusalem, but sometimes they go to other places and Wonderful. it seems like perfectly fine to me. Even in, there were some recent videos that were taking place during the time of uh, the protesters from Tel Aviv. And it just seemed like everything was normal. At least the places where this guy was walking. So uh, anyway, um, I, 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 I want to, something else she mentioned, I'd like to address, and I'm sorry to interrupt you, but just, no, part of it. Yeah. uh, 
there's a phenomenal thing that's going on here, which no one in the media is talking about. If we go back four or five years ago, by the way, obviously if we get cut off, we'll just repatch back in. But about three, four years ago, if you went to Tel Aviv, most people in Tel Aviv forgot that there's even a Jerusalem or could care less about Jerusalem because Tel Aviv was like, you know, the happening New York City on the Mediterranean type of energy and so on. And then many of them came up with these terms, post-Zionist, why are we even here? You know, why don't we just create a Jewish state in Uganda or whatever, whatever, whatever. I mean, that kind of like totally apathetic or anti any identity with the land or whatever. All of a sudden, all of a sudden, all these Tel Avivians, by the tens of thousands, are now carrying it like, like, in like nobody's business, the Israeli flag, with love and compassion, deeply concerned. Some of them marched for four days in 100 plus weather from Tel Aviv to Jerusalem to come to Jerusalem to make their voice heard because it's very important to them what's going on. I, I'm saying that without taking a side on one way or the other. I'm because I'm an observant Jew. I observe these things. So uh, you look at this and you see, my gosh, look how clever God is. Because you can never have inspired these people to suddenly pick up the flag. But now, by being so agitated, they took action. And the, and, I, and I used to go to these demonstrations. My wife went all the time. Not necessarily pro or con, but just to see and experience. And these left-wing secular people were beautiful people, orderly people, marched there was nobody breaking windows down the streets of fifth avenue nothing like this at all was going on no one was threatened no cars were burned etc cetera, etc cetera. no one pulled out pistols and just randomly shot people in the crowd so all those things that we become familiar with wasn't happening here but rather it was a kind of an a way of even this very alienated group suddenly rediscovered their patriotism i think that was like a you know so, so maybe it was like a good thing. There were like some, maybe some spiritual or just good benefits for them yes. in doing that. Yes. So, <clears throat> so yeah, that's good that there wasn't like, you know, destruction of property. Like you see sometimes in other places in the world when there's like mass protests and stuff like that. Cause I, I watched it pretty closely, wa watched all the videos I could. And it, it did seem to be like pretty okay. There was blocking of highways and stuff like that, but and I saw like one little fire. <laughs> it was like in the middle of a highway, but it was just like a, a single like branch that had set on fire. Maybe the guy with the news camera set. Yeah. <clears throat> but it didn't seem like there was a whole lot going on. And then the day after the vote, I mean, it, it seems like everything just kind of like died off. Yeah, now um, everyone's talking about the train to Saudi Arabia. What was that? Now everyone is talking about the, the train to Saudi Arabia. Oh, is that like a new like uh, like a new line that's going to be going from Jerusalem? Well, I mean, the whole country here is buzzed with a possible peace deal coming up with Saudi Arabia, which would include the building um, of a speed train between the two countries. Oh, I didn't I didn't know about that project. Um, I did see some news. I think of like the U.S. talking to Saudi Arabia, you know, trying to like rekindle things i guess I, I i don't know i haven't really followed that too closely <clears throat> but as far as like the, the this overhaul goes like is it something that you hear very much you know people talking about it like now less, less. Yeah. also don't forget the courts and, and the and the government are on vacation uh for the next three weeks i believe or as, uh, as a very uh facetious friend of mine said really how do you know they're on vacation what's different <laughs> well so what what do you think not that anyone's rooting for civil war but like th that term has been thrown around by a few different people like uh a what was his name ehud olmert the previous prime minister and right. um one who's in jail yeah in herzog in oh, herzog never said there will be a civil war well he no no he said one time, he said, you know, this. he didn't say that there will be, but he said, like, this was, like, early on, probably around the time of Passover. He said he made some statement mm -hmm. about, like, this, you know, if we're not careful, it could be civil war or something like that. He just said, he just said the term. Um, I don't know how, like, a war like that would even happen or what. Or whatever, but do you think that that's at all or like an overthrow of the government or forcing Netanyahu out? I, I was watching... 
I was watching uh this this is on YouTube, by the way. It's uh it was Ehud Barak talking to a think tank in um the UK earlier this year, uh Chatham House. I don't know if you've heard of them before. But anyway, whatever. They have a YouTube channel and he was talking about, you know, we've looked at the numbers. There was a study put out how they, they looked at all like protests <clears throat> and these kind of movements from the year 1900 until 2006, I think. And that the ones that are successful at getting the government to capitulate or be overthrown were the ones where you had um, the common denominator between all the successful ones was <clears throat> if you had at least 3.5% of the population out in the protests, uh, which equates to 8% of adults. And then if it's like persistent and it's like long and stuff like that. And I feel like I've seen the media, whether it's just because they're trying to get views or if they're like trying to make this happen, but they keep, it's almost like every time I read a, a media article, they're always talking about, wow, they're still angry. They're still, it's almost like they're like cheerleading the protests. Like, yeah. do you think that's what they're trying to do? Listen, uh, I'm really happy you're bringing this up. You, okay. <laughs> you've landed in my nest. I'll tell you why. First of all, I was a, uh, my major, I was Syracuse University. I was at SI Schoolhouse, SI Newhouse School of Communications. And it was there that I learned that the pen may be mightier than the sword, but the dollar is mightier than the pen. And at the end of the day, media is business. They have to sell advertising. They need viewers. And if, if you are just putting out there good news all the time, unfortunately, most people find that boring. People like to hear things because if there's something worse going on, there was going on in my life. I don't feel so bad because, wow, look at those guys. They're really having a bad time. Mm -hmm. So it, it, it becomes to the point where, and also another thing about a journalist is that every journalist who is employed, there's usually 10 that are not employed. And so if this guy doesn't get the scoop because somebody else beat it to him because he was doing something stupid like researching the facts, so he may get fired which that, that for sure he doesn't want. And then someone else will come in and he'll do something even skimpier without researching the facts because he knows that it's just expediency who breaks, they even call it this. Remember when breaking news was a novelty as opposed to a feature? Right? I, mean, I, like, actually, I actually do. <laughs> in fact, it was after 9-11. That's when I first like consciously remember seeing like just always news alert, news alert, news alert, just all the time because like, I remember following that story really closely, just being like, what the heck just happened? And then like, oh, news alert, this happened. I'm sure that it probably happened before that, but I do know what you're talking about. Like, yeah. Yeah. But now everything is breaking news, you know, breaking, and it's all, it's all, I hate to say it, it's manipulation of the masses selling them what, what the immediate things that you want to see. So I, I want to tell you an amazing thing. I just found this a little while ago. I don't want to interrupt our video. Otherwise I'd run and get it. I know where it is, but it's not worth it. I found old mad magazines dating back to like 1968, 67. I mean, you know, when they were still good. And they had one of them was the lighter side of the media. And I'll, I must tell you this, this, this was a strip. Okay. And the strip was as follows. There was a newsman from a camera group and he goes over and there are a group of black Americans just hanging out friends nice whatever whatever and he screams he says <clears throat> do you know that on the street so and so over there, there's a bunch of white guys with sticks and they're beating to death a black man and they're like what and the, and then the news guy disappears and he runs over and there's a group on another street of just a bunch of white guys just nice guys hanging out whatever and he says do you know on such and such a street right now there is a bunch of black guys beating a white guy to death and like what and then the next scene is the black guy group and the white guy groups all show up with their sticks and their bats and they engage and the cameraman's there getting his piece for the media. It's like that one James Bond movie. I can't remember, I think it was called Tomorrow Never Dies. And ultimately the bad guy in that one was uh, like- a Oh, media. the media mogul. Yeah. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. It's horrible. It's, yeah. Listen, I'll tell you something. In, in Jewish thought, the fly- is always associated with the devil because we say in our holiest of prayers, the Shema Yisrael, God says to us, do not go after your heart and eyes. 
And so the idea, like the flies, you know what they're normally attracted to, yep. right? And they've got yep. lots of little eyes and they're like the paparazzi. They're like all these little camera eyes and they're just looking for the, mm -hmm, to be able to land on it. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. You know who the first person to actually speak out, I remember, uh, this might have been, you might have been a little boy, Spiro Agnew. Do you remember that name? Uh -uh. Oh, he was one of your vice presidents. No, I don't, I don't even. Spiro Agnew. And I who, think who, who was he vice president to? I'm going to guess Lyndon Johnson. Oh, yeah. Well, that was that was definitely beyond my time. <laughs> yeah, you should look him up. I think he was a Southerner. And he was, most people thought he was like a really crazy rebel South guy. But I thought he was brilliant. And he was the first person who ever came out and talked about the negative impact that media as a business, because you know why? You don't really have any checks and balance on the media. I mean, yes, you can sue them. And Trump just failed trying to sue uh, CNN. But but it's really, they're, they're just sort of out there making up their own rules and putting up the facade of how diligent they are and how careful they are. But each each one of these guys is just selling to whoever it is that, that you know, that their advertisers want to reach. Yeah. That's, that's the really sad news about it. And the losers are us because it pollutes our, that, that's pollution, it pollutes our world. Yeah. It turns us into haters. It turns us into judging other people without really, you know, when I was a kid and I was still in America as a kid, my parents taught me that in America it's supposed to be that you are innocent until proven guilty. That's out the window. Today, somebody makes one claim about Kevin Spacey or who knows what, way before it ever comes to court. This guy is finished. His career is over. And I'm not talking about him per se. I don't even know who the guy he is. I just know he's an actor. But I'm, but I'm saying I watched this guy come tumbling down. He was completely tarred, feathered, and hung before he had his day in court. But what's that? that was, we were told that's what Russia was all about. Russia, you're guilty. You have to prove you're innocent. But America was always supposed to be you're innocent until proven guilty. Well, where is that anymore? Yeah. Not in the media. All right. Well, let me, um, if you don't mind, <clears throat> let's move on. I had another question. Uh, I should have pulled this up first. This was like actually the, the first question. There it is. Sorry. No, I guess that's not it. Nope. Sorry, I will get it at some point. That's all right. No, whatever. I thank your viewers for their questions. It's very sweet of them. Okay, I have another one. <clears throat> his name is uh, The Haystack. That's his username. Uh, he asks, or he says, ask if Messiah bin Yosef is part of their belief and what are their expectations of him? And you and I have talked about this before, but for The That's Haystack... So funny. If you could ask Haystack, that. I love that name. Haystack's cool. <laughs> is, is his name Haystack? Or is it Hey Stack? It's like, uh, no, it's like, hey, like a, a stack of hay out in the past. Oh, okay. Others like, hey, like, hey, hey, yo, you, hey, Stack. Hey, Stack. <laughs> <laughs> That's a great name. And I'm laughing because I was in a, a meeting today in on the Israeli West Coast. And, and the whole subject we got onto was the, uh, well, in Hebrew, called Mashiach ben Yosef, the Messiah, Joseph's Messiah, or however you pronounce it in English. That's why it's, I just find it very funny. I haven't spoken about this in who knows how long. A few hours ago, we were discussing it, and now this question comes back up. Wow, that's that's like two today. First, it was uh, talking about the tribe of Benjamin, and now it's this one. <laughs> uh, <laughs> there you go. So um, the answer, sure. I mean, the whole idea of, of Mashiach ben Yosef, is is throughout all Jewish literature, and uh, it, the interesting thing about it is the like like the gentleman asked, what is the role? So here's a a, a, sm a small snapshot. When King Saul, as you pronounce it, Shaul, when King Saul became king, his kingdom. And you can look this all up; it's right there in the Bible. His kingdom was qualified on his behavior. In other words. If he didn't stick with the word of Samuel the prophet, Shmuel and Navi, then he could and did lose the kingdom. In other words, his kingdom was only conditional upon his delivery, as opposed to King David, where it wasn't. That even if King David messed up, 
the kingdom was for his forever. So now, Saul was from, as we said earlier, Benjamin. Benjamin is from Rachel. Rachel's other son was Yosef. So the idea of the messianic line of Yosef is slash shared with Benjamin as well, because it's really from Rachel versus Leah, because Leah is where King David, Judah, Judah becomes King David. So it's really the mothers in a sense, even though we don't refer to them because they're hidden names. But that idea is that the messianic period would be temporary for King Saul. Now, the what, what are the three primary functions of the Messiah, Mashiach, on a, a very practical level? One is the building of the temple. Two is fighting the war against the nation of Amalek, the Amalekites. And three, yeah, yes, is uh, bringing the ingathering of the, of the exiles. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, because Benjamin slash Joseph's dynasty was finite, therefore the qualifiers all had to happen, but they had to happen in a finite environment, as opposed to, I'll come back to this, but as opposed to David, King David's dynasty, which will be forever, therefore could not be until it would remain forever. In other words, Unless it's going to be forever, then it's not King David. So it's the foreverness that, therefore, once it happens, it'll be like that forever. So, therefore, King David's reign, if you will, will be the last reign because it'll be the forever reign. Whereas the Joseph reign will be within history until King David because it has to be finite. So where do we see the fulfillment of that in Jewish history? of King of Yosef uh, three qualifiers is in the story of Purim. Mordechai. Mordechai was from the tribe of Benjamin. Ah, you're going to tell me that in the book of, of Esther, it says Mordechai HaYehudi. Mordechai HaYehudi means the Jew, but it, it meant like from the Judah. Yeah. Well, yeah, he was from the land of Judah, but if you read the end of that same verse, you'll see Yemini, which means he was a uh, Benjaminite. Mm -hmm. So the reason is from Judah is because there were only two tribes that survived. The other ten tribes had already been vanquished from the north. So the only tribes that exist were in a country called Judah, but that Benjamin was in the country called Judah. So it wasn't that he was a, a member of the tribe of Judah. He was a member of the tribe of uh, Benjamin. Now, what did Mordechai do? What, what was the whole Purim story? Well, he defeated a Amalek. That's the whole war against Haman or Haman. He brought the Jews, enabled the Jews to come back to Israel, which Ezra was the executioner, but Mordechai was the enabler. And that resulted in the building of the second temple. So therefore, you see that the three the qualifying events of Mashiach all were fulfilled, but in a finite way, because the second temple didn't remain. The Jews did not stay in the land of Israel. <clears throat> and there were still people of a Amalek who survived and went on to create other wars in the world and so on and so on. But when David comes, although even in David's own life, he tried to, to bring the world to its fruition, he did fight against the Amalekites, but he didn't completely fulfill the total commandment. He wanted desperately to build the temple, but God said, you can't because you have too much blood on your hands and your son Solomon will do it. But even though Solomon did it on the day of the inauguration of the temple, they couldn't open the doors. The doors would not open. And King Solomon then had to organize the people to chant the uh, certain sections. I, uh, gosh, I spoke too much Hebrew today, so it's not coming out in English that easy for me. It's like the other times. Uh, Psalms, you called mm -hmm. them, right? Sihilim. So a certain part of the Psalms, which are called the uh, Shia Malot, this, I think it's translated the, the Songs of Ascent. There are 15 Psalms that open with the words, if I'm doing a good translation, the Songs of Ascent, Shia Malot in, in Hebrew. And they're 15 because there were 15 steps from the holy up into the Holy of Holies, or, or sorry, from the 
courtyard up into the the um like the court of the priests yeah right there were 15 steps and king david wrote one first so when king solomon said those the doors opened and they opened by themselves to say that the whole merit of the temple was only because of your father of king david even though he wasn't allowed to do that now the one thing that he was lacking though of course and he was i don't know how he could have done it was in gathering because there was nobody to in gather in those days everybody was in however that will be in uh hopefully starting very soon will be that in gathering which has oh, certainly been happening over the last 80 years right you know and people when for example let's look at the story of Purim. that's a that's a story that goes over 19 years but when you read the story you think it was like six months so, you know, from a godly point of view, things happening over 80 years to us is like a lifetime. But for God, that's like a, like a few minutes, if you will. Yeah. So the in-gathering thing is, is clearly happening. I mean, from all, I mean, you know, I have to tell you, something, I, I, we have these special elevators at the Jerusalem train station. that go like 300 miles. You, like, you took the door to open. and want to have like little red horns and stuff like that. You went so deep down. But I, I was in there with my buddy and you're packed. And I said, when the doors open, I said, you know what? I counted six languages in the three minutes we were in the elevator. Wow. People were talking English and Hebrew and Spanish and French and Russian and Ethiopian and probably more. Just, just from a random selection in an elevator. So the in-gathering is like high speed. Of course, the temple is becoming a hot issue with the red heifers or like your shirt, the red dirt, you know, <laughs> and, and the war of Amalek, well, that hopefully, maybe that was World War II, I'd like to say that, but I don't think so. I think there's, you know, huge potential. Because we have um, in our literature uh, that it's kind of known that the Iranians, Persians, will threaten to destroy the entire world. And for, that's, we call it the War of Gog and Mogog. I think you call it Armageddon. Well, we call uh, it that too. Oh, Gog and Mogog? Okay. Yeah, there, there is Armageddon, but I think that's like a separate battle that's part of the the greater final war ah, okay so by the way most people don't know this I, I was in a in a shopping mall in melbourne australia and up on the wall they had a clock with these two guys were hitting the bell and the other one hit the bell it was called god will mow god and i realized people think god will mow god are two people it's not at all it's one person named god me means from he's god from the land of god mm -hmm. god me God, Mogok from the land of God. So there's one guy. Yeah. But anyhow, so in the in the Persians, though, that for many years the Jews used to laugh at that. In fact, I'll tell you a quick story. In the 1700s, in the uh city of Vilna, there was a great man known as the genius of Vilna, the Vilna Gong, and he held a class in which he was going to teach about this war. And the place was packed, 1700s. And he said that this war will last for 18 minutes. And everyone went, phew. You know, it takes me about four minutes just to get my, you know, my rifle loaded. Nobody, yeah, ah, well, ah, 18 minutes, not, not going to happen in 18 minutes, right? So now we have the Persians. And how, how could any country, let's say 150 years ago, threaten to destroy the whole world? You might threaten to take over the whole world, but that's not going to happen in a day. Even the Romans didn't conquer the world in a day. Alexander the Greek didn't conquer the world in a day. So... How do you threaten to destroy the whole world today? Well, now we know, thanks to Oppenheimer, we, we saw the movie. So we understand how it's possible. So now, if the Persians in the next few months announce that they have the atom bomb, nuclear bomb, and so on, and they have the delivery systems, thanks to the North Koreans. So uh, it could become a very exciting moment in history soon. Yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Man, I... Uh, yeah. So, okay, so with Mids so the answer is if I understood right, uh, Minsiah ben Yosef in Judaism, what it was an individual and it was Mordecai, he is recognized as Messiah ben Yosef. It's a bloodline, just like King David is a bloodline. So okay. it comes from, from Rachel into her son Benjamin and Joseph. It was manifest in one aspect as King Solomon, it was then manifest again about 500 years later in the form of Mordecai and Esther. And, and very well could be manifest right before the Mashiach ben David. Now, if that's the case, if there is to be another one, then the Mashiach ben Yosef might actually be the one who fights the war. 
and according to some opinions, gets killed in that war, but not necessarily. And and in Judaism, you wouldn't you wouldn't necessarily know that that person was um, of Joseph because again, right now, like you wouldn't know until Elijah comes because he's the one that's supposed to identify all the tribes, like to to clear up all the lineages, right? Like he, like obviously God <clears throat> would know, and so you'd have Messiah bin Yosef that would do his thing, but it probably wouldn't be till after the fact where it's like, oh, he was from this family. That was the most recent uh, iteration of a Messiah Ben Yosef. Right. I, yes. I, I don't know. But as from the <laughs> little I know, I, I, that makes sense to me. But I will tell you an interesting thing. King Solomon says, Ein chadash tachas Hashemish. There is nothing new under the sun. And that has a lot of meaning. And one aspect of what it means is that Although I, I I could go on for three hours discussing the creation of time, but I don't want to do that right now. And nor do you want me to do that right now. But in the in the brief is means that every generation is a mini cycle of all creation. So therefore, in each generation, it's the full capacity of fruition of creation. The only thing is, it might not be actualized because that generation didn't rise up to the standard to to make it happen. So what does that mean is that every generation is potentially or pregnant with the capacity to bring Messiah. So that means there had to be individuals who were the players that had it played out would have been them. And, and like you said, sometimes they're only identified, like, for example, Rabbi Akiva uh, believed that Bar Chachma was the Messiah. He was thoroughly convinced until one point when Bar Chachma did something, and maybe he keeps it, no, no, close but no cigar and walked away. But it shows that there was this innate potential in every generation. Okay. So <clears throat> with Benziah and Ben Yosef, just to understand, so it's a bloodline. It has appeared before, like in the case of Mordecai. It, it Now it could again before messiah or is it believed that it will absolutely before messiah been david or it's just a possibility well there are two camps one camp is absolutely you know oh, guys can i tell you that you know the joke about the jews stranded for 60 years on a deserted island yeah, I remember that one, but you should you should say it again for the. Okay, program. and finally he sees a boat. He goes like crazy and says, "Come on, we'll save." He said, "No, no, no! Before I have to show you, this is my life, my whole life. I built a whole city out of palm branches, and they're walking around. Here's my supermarket, and here's my cinema place, and here's my synagogue, and here's the football field, and here's the other synagogue. So, other synagogue? I thought you're alone. He says, "Yeah, I never go to that one." <laughs> so you know, sorry, that one just like gets funnier and funnier the more I think. <laughs> Exactly. So if you ask me a question, is it definitely or is it maybe? The answer is yes. Okay. So there's different opinions. Are those opinions from the Talmud or, or like oh, contemporary sure. people? For sure. You know what? Your viewers might find interesting. This is phenomenal website called the People's Talmud. They know about it. I'm kidding. And I bring it, it up. I bring it up a number of times. I like, know. I know. I'm just teasing you. But on the search page, under the set, there's listings and there's categories. Under categories is a section called end of days. And the drop down window, if you click on end of days, one of them is called the Mashiach Ben Joseph. And it'll take you at least initially to the seven times in the Talmud that discusses the idea of Mashiach Ben Yosef. Okay. Might not be enough for the what the person's looking for, but at least it's a starting point. So if there, if so, let's say that that opinion's right. <clears throat> if there, yeah. if there is kind of like a final iteration before Messiah comes, Messiah bin David, mm -hmm. then he would just he would accomplish, or he would in some way accomplish those same three things: the in gathering of the exiles, the fighting of Amalek, and then um, <laughs> get the temple. He so how would he, now? If that opinion is correct, how do you imagine that that would happen? Like he would like lay the groundwork for the building of the, of the temple or he would in some way do it? I don't know. Because so again, we get back into that controversy. Will the temple be built by us? Will the temple come down prefab? Will we begin to build it? And then it'll come down. By the way, just a little side point. 
uh, the third temple is is not going to just be on the current Temple Mount. I mean, the third temple is is like twenty times the size of what the other temples were because the third temple is not a Jewish thing; it's a global thing. It's for all human beings because there's only one God. So all people will be welcome there, right? That's the famous Isaiah chapter fifty six, verse seven. Yeah, and and that's according to the measurements given in Ezekiel. Yes. As well, um, <clears throat> well, I, I, okay. I have a question. I, I don't know what you'll say, but I just, I, I, um, I found out a while ago. I, I guess it's been going on ever since like 2010. But in the city of David, they uncovered what they think could have been Melchizedek's uh, temple. Like, have you heard of that? It's oh, like it, God. every day in the Jerusalem Post is another unbelievable find of of. It's getting crazy, all the stuff that's being found. But yes, I do remember hearing about that. Malchia said it. Yeah. Uh, what, would that have any religious significance in, in Judaism as far as like having it be like a religious site? Or what, what's like the, the opinion of that? Well, we believe that Malchia said it was shame. Adam's son. Uh, Noah's Noah's son. Uh, excuse me. Yes, Noah's son. Thank you. Yeah. Yes, Shane. Right. That's who he was, and he was, you know, the great grandfather of Abraham as well. Yeah. And uh, when do you remember the name in the Bible of the city that he was in? It was called Shalom or Shal mm -hmm. Shalom Salem, like you have in Massachusetts Salem. But it's really from the Hebrew word Shalom, which means peace. And because he was the high priest who sought to bring his father's teachings, teachings of Noah, he, Noah was given seven primary commandments, which he believed because he, he witnessed, you know, the ultimate genocide of the entire world. And he understood what had been the malfunctions in society. And he believed that these seven building blocks, which equated to the seven days of creation, could help mankind or as my grandfather used to call it, man unkind, uh, rebuild a peace world. Therefore, he was the man of peace, and the city that he resided as a high priest was called peace. But it was later, though, when he lost that priesthood to his great-great-great-great-grandson, Abraham, that Abraham then changed the name of the city to, uh, well, in Hebrew, Ireh, which is translated as awe, fear, but not the little fear, like I'm afraid someone's going to hit me, but the, the type of fear you fear when you're overwhelmed standing in the edge of the Grand Canyon and you realize how small we are. So that that's like an awe. He changed it to awe and he added it to the name. So the name Jerusalem is actually Yerush, Yira Shalayim, Shalom. It's the, the name that was in the days of uh, Machiat Tzedek, Shalom. And then Abraham added a first part to it called Iru. So it became Iru Shalom, Iru Shalayim. That's where the name Jerusalem comes from, was through mm -hmm. that mixture of those two. But therefore, his temple was a holy temple for sure. But, you know. But there, there wouldn't be any, like, um, use of it, like, right now, basically, or, or like, you would never, I, I, like, convert well, it into, huge, like, a huge usage for it. Oh, okay. <laughs> that is to sell tickets and bring tourists there. <laughs> with with this, with the concept of um, him being a high priest, <clears throat> like in Judaism, was there like a line of priesthood, like going back to Adam, or what? Or no, was just he a singular? To, okay. Going back to Shem, just to Shem. So, like, yeah. would Noah would not have been a high priest? Like, how did he? How did he get the? Uh, well, how, how how did how was he a high priest, or like how did that happen? Yeah, well, first of all, Noah was not, but Noah was a prophet, of course. But uh, Shem, the word, what does the word Shem mean? I don't know. Oh, that's important. It means name. Like we. Oh, call wait, it. I no, I did know that. It was in the back of I, I knew that. And that's how we refer to God as the name, ha yeah. Shem, ha -shem the name. Yeah. So his, his idea, and, and a name is supposed to be something that reflects a person's spiritual and energy or entity. So this man was unlike his other two brothers, um, Ham and, and uh, Yafet, right? They were 
we often comes to the word beauty, right? So that's like the nature of man is like civilizations and technologies and wisdom and all these things which are wonderful. It's all about man. And then ham is from the word energy, fire, power, and another aspect of man. But shame is something above man. It's, it's something spiritual. It's a name. It's like on a higher level. So his nature was one of a higher level, and therefore he was very appropriately became a priest, the high priest. And then later, uh, what, would you say that Abraham was after that a high priest? Oh, for sure. Now, obviously, they wouldn't. Have, well, I, well, actually, I don't know. Um, they wouldn't have worn the same like clothes that the high priest at the time of the temple would have worn, right? Because no, I would doubt that. That, I guess there's probably not very much detail about that anyway, right? Well, there is a detail in the Bible of God telling them what a high priest's clothing looks like. And had it already been known, why would God waste his time to say, so just, you know, use that over there, what you always use. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, let me just check really quick because we're uh, coming up on about an hour now. It's been about an hour. I just wanted to see, were, were there any other, let's see. I think we've pretty much hit it up. Uh, Melissa Wilson says about the third temple, please ask about the third temple. And then twin angels says red heifers. Yeah, I think, I think I hit them all up and we talked about that pretty good. So, um, like what, what's the, per uh, well, no, let, let's talk about just last thing, Amalek. So <clears throat> that was, and is currently a nation or is it like a like what is Amalek it, it, today you know when you look in the mirror you see yourself but you actually are, are looking at a complete reversed image of yourself right the the left of the mirror is your right and so on even though we don't think like that because we just think oh I'm looking at myself but you're not it's the opposite of what you're looking at so Amalek is the total opposite of of the Jewish people Every other nation is has some part or something and some, but these are the two completely diametrically opposed sides. And therefore, just like the Jews were thrown out of their land and, and, and diversified, so too the Amalekites were thrown out of their land. Just like Jews find their way into other cultures and countries and become very prominent figures in those countries on levels of medicine or art or even politics or military or whatever, Amalek is the same. It also finds a host nation and gets involved in that country and influences it and so on. So they are somebody who continues to be very much alive. The only way that we at least identify them is uh, by people who hate us with no reason. I mean, there are plenty of reasons to hate us. I'll give you a list. But for no reason, that that's already a mullet. That's interesting. So that's a really interesting thought. So it's kind of like they're essentially uh diffused throughout the nations and it's not like you can like trace uh well i guess their god could do it but it's not like we could like trace a lineage back to amalek but you can detect them by their attitudes and um you know beliefs and you know the way that they, they, they that they treat the jewish people essentially right okay because they're god's whipping Host. The, right? God uses them when we're not doing what we're supposed to be doing. Then they come as the savage dog that chases us back to God. Yeah. Yeah. I saw a beautiful thing today. Somebody said, why, God, are you leading me through troubled waters? And God answered, because your enemy doesn't know how to swim. <laughs> All right. Well, I think we'll, we'll end it on that. So as always, thank you for your time. And Oh, you guys, for, for next time, you know, submit questions, put it in the comments of this video. And then before I talk to Rabbi Gerfine again, I'll put out another thing on the community tab because that's where I got these questions from was under the community tab. Um, and then we'll ask that next time. Uh, if you haven't already, please make sure to subscribe, like this video if you liked it. Leave your thoughts and opinions down in the comments below. Also make sure to share it and I'll talk to you guys later.